Hi, everyone. We're so glad you've joined us here at Center for Brain Health for Sips and Science. Let's get started with a brief video underscoring the importance of brain health for you and for society. After that, we'll introduce our speaker. We work, we live, we innovate, and create. At the center of it all is your brain health. The ability to solve problems, think analytically, share empathy, and thrive. We're trying to make brain performance really the next fitness revolution. So how do you boost brain power? Welcome to the Brain Health Project, an urgent call to transform your mind to work stronger and faster. This is an absolute crisis, as great as any we have ever faced. We have to equip the minds and brains of our citizens to cope with the accelerating, dizzying rate of change that they face in their lives. Your brain health is not fixed. Scientific discoveries prove it can adapt and grow regardless of your starting point. Our greatest value, the asset that will help us to change everything, every problem we're in, is all in our head. To harness that treasure, we must measure and monitor progress while things are going well versus waiting for an injury or disease to strike. Too many of us are outliving our brains, and that does not have to be the case. The information age is bombarding us with more content than our human brains can handle. How do you keep from getting lost in this and focus on deep thinking? For starters, stop multitasking. Science shows us that multitasking is bad for your brain. It reduces fluid intelligence, causes brain atrophy, and increases chronic stress. The global pandemic is creating more stress than ever. Stress that leads to depression and anxiety and beyond. Unlocking our potential to navigate these hurdles starts with learning the right strategies, even in school. So when teachers have these strategies, they're empowered to support our learners, and then the learners are now able to take ownership of their learning. Training kids how to think is doubling academic achievement among middle schoolers. I think the greatest national security threat is pre-K through 12. If we don't take care of educating our young men and women, then we have to ask ourselves, where, where are we going to be in 20 years? Our world-renowned scientists know you can increase your brain health, not lose it. It's time for a new category of health, brain health. You are a game changer. Ready to transform the world with us? Be a part of the brain health revolution. It starts... Welcome everybody to Center for Brain Health and our continuing Sips and Science series. We are super excited tonight to have, and it, here's his moniker, and he probably doesn't like people saying this, but Dr. Walter Greenleaf is the godfather of therapeutic virtual reality. Uh, I can't I, think. Of <laughs> I, I really, I really need to push that. I'm, I, I, I'm trying to come up with something better, Steve. How about Yoda? The Yoda. There you go. There you go. But listen. We are, I'm going to let uh, two of my favorite people, Jennifer Zients is going to introduce Walter uh, more, more deeply. Jennifer's our deputy director here and head clinician at Center for Brain Health. And she's in charge of really translating the research we do at Center for Brain Health into services and technology. And speaking of technology, that's where Dr. Greenleaf comes in and just knocks it out of the park. So listen, I just want to plug us a little bit. Um, one of the main things we're trying to do here at Center for Brain Health is bring brain health to as many people as possible. And we're doing that through what we call the Brain Health Project. Dr. Greenleaf is also one of our collaborators in that endeavor. And if you think of what's been done for heart health over the past 100 years, Center for Brain Health is doing that for the brain. And that's what the project is all about. You'll hear more about that and how to participate in the project or support it. Uh, we are a not-for-profit, so anything you can do to help is greatly appreciated. I'll turn it over to Jen. 
Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, for me, I am extremely excited to have Dr. Greenleaf. Just like Steve said, we're all about translation of advances in technology and research. And Dr. Greenleaf is leading the way in technology. And so I'm so excited to have him. He is one of our partners in the Brain Health Project. He is an internationally known early pioneer. He's the Yoda, right? In the medical application of, vir of virtual environment technology. He is one of the founders of the field. He's a neuroscientist and a medical technology developer at Stanford. He has over three decades of research and development experience. He's currently focused on application of virtual reality and digital health technology to address difficult problems in behavioral and physical medicine. Things like post-traumatic stress, anxiety, depression, traumatic brain injury, addiction, autism. And he has designed and developed numerous clinical systems, including surgical simulation, 3D medical visualization, ergonomic evaluation technology, automatic sleep staging systems, psychophysiological assessment, digital e-health products for behavioral medicine. He's a leader. I mean, I could go on and on and on about Dr. Greenleaf, but he's a leader nationally and internationally. He's well-respected, highly regarded scientist who is a very valuable collaborator and collaborator in the greatest sense of the word. And he is one of the things I love most about Dr. Greenleaf is he's interested in advancing the work of all for the benefit of all. So Dr. Greenleaf, please take it away. We're excited to have you. Wow, well, well thank you so much for the very warm and slightly embarrassing introduction. Uh, at least you didn't say I'm one of the elders of the field. Uh, that always, uh, you know, that always gets me. Um, I'm so glad to be here with you, and I am, um, you know, such a strong proponent of the work that you do and the work at the Center for Brain Health, and thank you for inviting me. I'm going to try and set the stage by going, giving some slides. I'm going to try and go through them very quickly to provide a bit of an overview, and I'll, I'll make sure they're available later for anybody who has an interest. Uh, uh, so that if I do go sort of fast, uh, at least the details will, will be there. So let me share my screen now and we'll jump into it. Well, um, one of the, um, my topic is uh, how machine learning, biosensing, virtual reality technology are converging and how they can help us with uh, boosting brain health, but also other clinical uh, issues and also help us with um, general health and wellness. Uh, it's an exciting time for me because um, uh, it, it really has been uh, uh, several decades of work waiting to see how VR technology can be applied and it's finally crossing over. So let me go into some details of the presentation here that will expand on those points. Okay, one of the reasons that uh, we're all working so hard is uh, we're very conscious that there's a looming healthcare crisis uh, engendered because of an aging population. The um, North American uh, population um, has almost doubled since I was a youngster in the 60s, and yet the family sizes have gotten smaller. So proportionately, we're just not going to have enough formal or informal caregivers to support us when we get up into our 80s and 90s and longer. We're living longer, but we still have a lot of um, challenging health problems as we live longer. And really, the only way out of it is to leverage technology. It's what we have to do. And I, I think it's a looming crisis that's going to be, many are saying it's going to be worse than um, some of the issues involving climate change uh, uh, or, or other challenges to, to us as a society. So we're all working very hard to come up with some solutions. And the good news is we're making great progress. I'm going to talk today about how VR and AR technology is working with other emerging technologies to facilitate that. Um, the good news is it's happening. Um, we have uh, fantastic systems and we'll hear from uh, Aaron from your Charisma program later today about one specific example, but there's already a lot of fantastic applications that are moving out of the academic arena and moving into the, uh, um, the early adopter stage. Many of the large hospital networks are starting to bring them in. It's very exciting. So let me get into some specifics. As everybody who's listening knows, we're in the middle of a digital health revolution. Um, and what's very exciting about that is that we're shifting the locus of care. And part of this has been because of uh, uh, the COVID pandemic, but also it was in process way before that. 
we're making the patient the center of care. Sometimes patients might be need to go to a hospital or to a clinic for their care, but more and more often, we're leveraging technology to have the care come to them wherever they're located. Um, every medical device has been moved from the analog handwritten world, where it was just as recently as uh, 10 or 12 years ago, to now a digital world. Uh, every measurement system, most of the um, uh, ways we capture data is being pushed to a electronic medical system. And it's also data that we can collect from some of the sensors that we can wear. Uh, we are starting to start hearing hearables and wearables where we collect the data passively from our, our cell phones and from other systems. Uh, and it's not just the physical aspects of our of our healthcare, it's it's also the behavioral and the cognitive and the emotional aspects of how we're doing. We can collect brain health biomarkers from passive data from our smartphone. Voice analytics and facial expression data can be used as a biomarker of pain or anxiety or depression. Uh, we can capture facial expressions and use that as a way to see how someone responds to uh, a, a particular challenge and infer their cognitive or their emotional state. And we can use AR and VR technologies to challenge people and get some dynamic measurements based on how they're reacting to a very complex stimulus instead of a paper and pencil type of test. It's, it's really quite amazing. We're also seeing a change in our business model uh, where we're now no longer just saying, here's a medication. We're sometimes saying, here is a prescription digital system that you can use um, to help you with your healthcare. And then sometimes we also combine them where you might have a medication, but it might be accompanied by uh, some other system, a wearable or an app that worth the prescription medicine works in harmony and gets incremental effects. Uh, the amazing thing right now is we're entering this uh, era where we're starting to be able to come up with a more customized precision approach to delivering care to the individual and not as much of a one size fits all approach. We have a fantastic way of interacting with individuals, leveraging computer technologies and smartphone technologies and VR and AR systems, but also ways to have uh, that data be aggregated, protected, and but used for population analysis or for research studies and help us refine the protocols that, that we need to move forward. It's gonna allow us to not just make a clinical change based on a visit every month, but we're gonna have different decision nodes based on uh, data from uh, wearable sensors or from behavioral data. Um, it will integrate so that we can now see here's the time to make a change and not wait for a, a two week out visit. Um, and let me describe briefly some of the technologies that are moving along in confluence with this change in how we're delivering medicine. Uh, we're entering into the era of uh, internet of things where Every, um, every device is going to have a sensor into it and they'll be networked together. This will allow us to collect about a lot of information about uh, our health status and our moods and, and our challenges. We're entering into the era of ubiquitous 5G connections. This will allow us to do cloud-based rendering of very complex graphical scenes and push that out to our display systems. It means our AR and VR systems, instead of being these heavy devices, will be lightweight, more like sunglasses. And we're going to be able to also analyze the data very rapidly, make complex decisions in real time instead of waiting for um, it to be turned around, going up to the net and back. We're using machine learning to do better predictive analytics. And we're also um, emulating the model that um, has been used in industry for a long time, where there's very expensive machinery um, and they often would build a, a digital twin of that machine to do scenario planning. So what if we replace this part without having to shut down the system? We now can do the same thing for, for our health. We can take our genetic data, our behavioral data, our, our on-the-spot wearable sensor data, um, data accumulated over time, and we can do some what-if planning. Like what if I do elect to have a total knee replacement? Uh, how will that affect my mobility? How will that affect my exercise? Will it have downstream effects in terms of weight? What are the pluses and minuses? And we can model that and make our clinical decisions looking at the whole system of an individual and, and giving the patient more agency on the choices. Um, 
we're also um, having some cultural shifts too, where we're getting much more comfortable with the idea of having um, uh, speaker systems that hear what we're saying and pay attention and respond with an AI system. And some people may feel uncomfortable about that, but it's coming and we can use it to help us do better healthcare delivery. Uh, we're also getting better with different dimensions of sensory input. Uh, I, I recently had a chance to try out a three-dimensional olfactory generation system where you could have some dimensionality to um, a experience in virtual reality where you might be holding a bouquet of roses and smelling it, but then you put it down and the smell clears really fast and you turn around and there's a lawn being mowed behind you. That allows us to evoke memories and create more of a sense of presence within the virtual environment. We're also getting better at having representations of each other in the virtual environment. Um, Heretofore, uh, they've often, you know, when we've had an agent in a virtual um, world looking like us, it didn't have all that very rich nonverbal communication, facial expressions, body language, gestures just weren't there. And we're now in a better position to create avatars that can represent us. And also AI systems allow us to be present in a way uh, offline so that if a clinician uh, discharges a patient, instead of giving them a stack of papers to read about uh, wound care, uh, the patient can log on, talk to an avatar of the clinician and get basic questions answered. Uh, we're also getting better at having much more um, rich and um, diverse, culturally appropriate and age appropriate multi-user virtual worlds. And Aaron, I know you'll be talking a little bit about that later, but with cloud-based uh, real-time 3D rendering, we can create a whole universe of experiences for people to be there and not just themselves, but with other people. So uh, very briefly, um, the, there's a number of different terms floating around. There's virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, extended reality. For me, it's a spectrum of immersion. And uh, we now have different categories, but I think it will soon uh, sort of merge into just one term. Uh, right now, the term that's used for that overarching environment is extended reality technology, but that may change too. But a large number of technology companies are putting billions of dollars into moving forward the technology, and it's really just getting started. We're sort of in the 300 baud modem days. And uh, I think uh, around the corner, it will become the next way we work, the next way we design things, the next way we communicate with each other, how we socialize um, and it's going to be much better than texting or, or typing because it'll have that rich um, experience involving our, our facial expressions, our body language. We'll feel like we're there as opposed to uh, just being limited to the small pipeline of texting and typing. So why use these environments, especially in healthcare? Well, we can do more and I'll try and give some examples, but we can do deeply personal, highly functional and unique things in a virtual environment that we just can't do uh, otherwise. And if you haven't had a chance to try a good virtual reality system, uh, um, well, perhaps stop by the Center of Brain Health sometime and, and try out one of their systems, but they're really getting better every year and they're pretty amazing right now. The adoption rate has actually been faster than uh, some of the other technologies we use, faster than the uh, adoption of color TVs or the video cassette recorder or even the acceptance of personal computers. It's really, especially with augmented reality, is soaring really fast. I think Pokemon Go had a lot to promote that. And um, the, based on parts order, um, we're, we're already seeing the trend and they're anticipating that there'll be 70 million people using XR systems within the next uh, six years. So again, all aspects of the enterprise are going to be impacted by these powerful emerging technologies, but I think healthcare is going to be one of the key leading enterprise areas. And I'm going to try very quickly now just to get a bit more of an overview of where, there, where we've made progress and where some of the opportunities are. And it's really the full stack of healthcare that we're seeing um, um, progress in, helping people do the difficult task of uh, paying attention to their health, uh, exercising, eating well, uh, managing stress, um, paying attention to your brain health, uh, objective assessments of our mood instead of paper and pencil testing, more functional testing, more functional training of our clinicians uh, where they can practice in a simulated environment and learn to make mistakes or learn to be prepared for unusual events, much like a flight simulator is used to train pilots for rare events. 
improved interventions that make a big impact on clinical care, new ways to facilitate adherence. It's healthcare is not easy and ways to gamify or make people um, feel more personal agency in their healthcare process and ways to reach underserved populations in a, in a much more robust way. All sectors of medicine have had some um, advancements leveraging VR and AR technology. Um, I, I used to sometimes say I haven't seen anything in urology yet, and yet we do now. It's uh, really moving forward and being leveraged in all sectors of medicine. Many of the larger uh, players are jumping on board in a big way. Um, um, the market is projected to be $5 billion by 2026, um, but the, some of the larger health networks, uh, some of the medical device and um, advanced hospitals are making a big push to see where they can bring VR and AR technology in. And some of the pharma companies are also doing combination therapy uh, using um, VR technology. And I, I have to just because uh, my background is that of a neuroscientist, just talk about why VR has such impact and how can we leverage it for doing so much, especially in mental health care. Well, the, the short story is that we can leverage the brain's um, ability to change by activating our reward system, getting people to pay attention, to, to have a, a positive experience. It can shape and actually dynamically change your neurocircuitry. We can shorten the reward feedback loop and show people the results of the choices they make, and that can, that can make it possible to uh, um, make the difficult change of uh, shifting your behavior. And I'll give some examples of that. And we can leverage the brain's neuro, uh, mirror neuron systems. Uh, in order to change your brain system, you need to be able to activate it. And with VR environments and with the challenges that we can put inside them, uh, we can activate um, a mood or a cognitive process and teach people the uh, how to manage their, their moods by in a reproducible way being able to evoke uh, uh, the brain's reward system and help them um, practice and learn the skills they need. Uh, we can create an avatar of an individual. We can age progress that avatar so you can see what you would look like in 40 or 50 years. Now, that might seem like uh, a scary thing, especially when we've studied Stanford undergraduates and had them be part of our studies. They did not like to see their age progress avatar at all. But we learned that it can be a powerful way to shape people's behavior to see how the choices you make now um, uh, affect your longevity and your health later in life. And you almost need to see it to believe it and you need to connect with that future self. And it's a powerful way of shifting behavior. The other powerful tool we have is the ability to have a narrative story uh, to, one of the things that motivates people is being part of a story or understanding a story. And heretofore, healthcare has been sort of I have a short amount of time to talk to you about the problem. Now, le leveraging VR and AR technology, we can create more complex, robust way to uh, attract people, have them be part of a healthcare journey, their own narrative in whatever style works for them. And in case you've been thinking that VR technology has only been around for five or six years, uh, it really has been around. It's been very expensive and it's been to many degrees sort of uncomfortable to use for decades and mostly in academic research centers. But since I got involved um, for more than 37 years ago, things have really changed. And the good news is there's been a large number of people working very hard to in the academic arena to understand what works, what doesn't work. So there is a foundation of research showing the pathway. Now we need to redo it with larger group sizes and today's technology, but we do have that fundamental understanding of where things are and where they're going. And really it's the full stack of healthcare that's being affected. Uh, uh, training, how, how to have good clinical skills or interpersonal skills or how to work as a team if you're in the clinical environment. We have virtual patients that you can practice uh, on practice taking a patient history, for example, and uh, learn learn how to deal with different cultural groups and different age groups. And, and most exciting, I think, is we're giving people a chance to practice to have how to have difficult conversations. It's, it's very difficult for everyone to talk about a, a terminal illness and the impact on a family. And it's not the sort of thing you want to get wrong. And one of the challenges that our clinical care providers have is, is getting burnt out too. 
we can help managing the stress of that and also have them practice being able to handle difficult situations in advance so they know how to handle someone who's angry or someone who's very sad or someone who's uh, very confused. Uh, it gives us great ability to learn things that otherwise might be difficult to learn. Um, some hospitals are requiring uh, their um, uh, medical residents to go through a simulation training so they know how to handle um, an emergency and can practice offline. Uh, we're getting better at objective assessments, uh, especially those involving brain health. Uh, we can come up with um, complex challenges to do a better cognitive assessment using a standardized environment. Uh, we can fold in wearable sensor technology, ca capturing EEG and heart rate and other signals and facial expressions and have that be part of the assessment. And um, some groups like Lee Williams, uh, who I collaborate with at Stanford, have been identifying different um, body biotypes by using brain imaging and then seeing how we can identify those different biotypes using VR challenges. That means we can come up with a more precision medicine approach to treating depression at the primary care level where we can evaluate someone and say, well, for you, this is the pathway you should go down. For someone else, it might be a different pathway. Um, just very quickly, how uh, VR is being used. Uh, we'll hear um, from Aaron about the Charisma program for um, teaching social skills for, for people who, for example, are on the autism spectrum disorder. VR has been used for preoptive planning and helping someone design an operation, but uh, most importantly, I think, being able to communicate to the patient what is the going, what the approach is going to be and have them participate in making some of the choices that might be, need to be made. VR has been used to facilitate uh, recovery from stroke and traumatic brain injury, um, making that pro arduous process much more uh, robust and measurable. And then in the field of mental health care, so many opportunities uh, helping with um, um, anxiety disorders and phobias, um, helping with depression, social anxiety disorder, chronic pain, um, attention deficit disorder. There's a very long list and uh, it's even picking up speed. Um, I'm excited by what we can do to help people with who are struggling with uh, uh, problems with alcohol or substance of abuse to learn refusal skills or practice uh, how to push back to peer pressure. But you need to learn to do that when the cravings are evoked and when you're in a social context. And we can do that very well with a virtual environment. And then in the area of health and wellness, we can show people um, how to make the choices and make it interesting to do some the sometimes difficult thing of going down a healthcare pathway. And again, we've had some great results at our lab at Stanford of using um, the feedback loop of having your future self um, give you a phone call when you walk into a bar and say, hey, we talked about that and why, why are you doing that to, to us? Uh, just one example. And we're seeing things cross over from the clinical world where you might um, be part of a uh, prepartum training course uh, as you're in the process of preparing to give birth and you take the system home with you and you have it afterwards to help you uh, with, rem remember the, the skills that you learned for managing stress and anxiety, for example. So I'm sorry I've had to go through this so fast, but I want to put the basic information out there for discussion. Um, uh, I'm excited because so many of the challenges we have in senior care are addressed by these technologies, ad addressing isolation and loneliness, uh, acute and chronic pain, depression and anxiety, uh, physical rehabilitation, um, uh, so many things that will have a great impact in, as we help our aging population. So if you're interested in this topic, there's a couple uh, conferences that go on every year that where people from the research or the uh, clinical area meet with the engineers and, and the uh, product developers to talk about what can happen. Um, so thank you, thank you for the invitation to have the opportunity to talk with you today. And I'm, I hope we have some um, some questions because I'm so passionate about this area and I'd love to hear what you think. Thank you, Walter. We have some really great questions and I just wanted to remind everyone, put your questions into the Q&A. We're gonna get to them. Um, but before we do that, I don't know how many in our audience have ever been or experienced or even seen an immersive environment. And so we wanted to give you a chance. I wanted, um, we are, our, our, my colleague, our colleague, 
Aaron Tate, who is head of emerging technologies and has worked a lot with Dr. Greenleaf, is going to share his screen and kind of give us a glance at first so everybody can kind of see what it's like. Aaron, you ready? Yes. So, um, Walter, first off, this is, uh, I just want to say thank you. You always do such a great job of, um, you know, explaining and getting people excited about the potential and the possibilities um, in this in this field. So thank you, as always. Um, so Charisma, uh, as as has been mentioned, Charisma is a social cognition training platform um, at its core. You know, uh, it is it's very similar to, to what it was, um, you know, over a decade ago when when it was first um, conceived uh, here at Center for Brain Health. And, and it is, you know, to connect uh, clinicians who are, are, are you know, um, training uh, kids on the autism spectrum or since, you know, we've, we've branched out to, you know, kids with social deficits and, th and things like that. Um, so it, it's, you know, a chance for them to um, connect in a virtual world where they can role play these scenarios and, and really train um, the, the social strategies that they need. Um, you know, we started in a, in a gaming platform that was kind of off the shelf and then quickly, you know, um, exceeded the limits of that and then, and, you know, transitioned to, uh, you know, an early version that was, you know, like one or two rooms. Um, and then slowly over the last, you know, 10, over the last decade, we've, we've branched out to this kind of open world environment where, you know, we can have any kind of avatar that's, um, you know, they can conceive. We've got, you know, props and, and, and costumes and things like that for for the participants to to use, um, but really we we respond to the clinicians that are administering this type of uh, intervention. We we take the requests that they have and try to make charisma better um, as it you know as the next version evolves. And that's how we we got to where we're at now. Um, more of our some of our recent innovations are. Uh, things like deliverability through a, an internet browser. You know, for the longest time, we had to have a PC um, that was, you know, had a had an intensive graphics card to to play Charisma on. But uh, here recently, we've been able to. Uh, our engineering team has been hard at work, and, and they've uh, cracked, you know, browser deliverability, which really gives, you know, the ability to have uh, clinicians connect with. Uh, the, participants or clients that are anywhere you know if they can if they have a device whether it's a tablet or a or a smartphone um, they're able to connect to charisma and and have you know a social training session so that's kind of the state of charisma and where we're at with it um, I, I certainly want to you know get back to Jennifer and um, thank you know Walter again for you know everything he does in the field but um, yeah but I think it's super cool because to be able to see, hopefully everyone you can tell, we're in a school right now, right? We're in the gymnasium or you were in the coffee shop and walking down the streets and kind of the interaction. And so one of the questions actually, I think I have this for you, Walter, because, you know, Aaron's talking about the um, how we have this ability to interact through avatar with another person, but it's through avatar. You talked a lot about the smart avatar and the ability to for people to talk to their avatar to get medical information or clarity on something, but even just the technology that's improved so much around facial expression. I still am interested, though, in Walter, what's your take on the impact on social connectedness? Well, I think it's I think there's going to be a number of um, amazing impacts. I think that, you know, COVID and the experience has taught us that we can do some things that we previously thought were difficult to do, uh, leveraging um, the internet and Zoom calls and things like that. But there's a limp drawback to that way of interacting. Um, it uh, It's actually a lot of people suffer from uh, Zoom fatigue where uh, you have these very intense uh, face, head, you know, your head is talking and you're looking at other people on their face and it's not the natural way that we interact with each other. We're usually when we're social, we're moving around, we're, we're doing things, we're glancing around the room um, 
and in a way it's 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 better to be able to have an experience in a virtual environment and i remember when i was um, developing some systems uh, to help with um, our our returning servicemen and women who had been in combat and had suffered a lot of uh, stress and um, uh, sometimes severe stress from their experiences over there i interviewed them as we were designing our virtual reality systems to treat post-traumatic stress and I asked, how did you stay in touch with your, your family and your friends while you were deployed? And this was 10 years ago. And they said, well, we would meet in World of Warcraft, that, uh, which is an online virtual uh, multi-user game. And I said, you would meet your mom in World of Warcraft? And they said, well, we weren't playing the game. We were just walking around and talking. And it's just much more comfortable. And I think as we evolve virtual environments, uh, move away from just texting and and um, direct eye contact video calls, I think we'll find more ways to be with each other that is much more natural. Yet we can still work with people, you know, our family members and spend time with our, our relatives who might be in a hospital or in a senior care center. We can be with them instead of um, um, in, in a more robust way and we can do things with them. We can have experiences. It's so cool to think about that. So when I think about all this potential, what in your opinion is holding, what's holding back? What are the factors that hold back the utilization of VR and AR? Well, um, it is a bit of, a, of an issue of not everyone has um, had the opportunity to have an experience until you've had a VR experience with a good VR headset. You, it's often hard to tell what the impact is. And I think until it's one of these things I think will cascade once there's a critical mass. Um, there's one large health care um, um, group that I have been talking to that has the vision of putting a home health hub to all their members. And part of that would be able to do some, you know, uh, sensing and uh, capturing data about sleep and health in general. But part of it is being able to have a VR headset that they could use for teaching uh, mindfulness skills or to connect people with their clinician. I think once something like that happens, and the technology doesn't have to be very expensive, you can get a really good VR system for around $300, $350 now. So much less than the cost of an of, of, of a, uh, expensive smartphone. So I think there will be a point where it just sort of rolls out, but we've been waiting for good, better content, better design content. You can, some people report that they've had uh, some simulator sickness by using some of the earlier VR systems. And a lot of that is just poor design. If you move the world around someone, you're bound to make them feel nauseous. But if you give them agency to move themselves, it's much better. So it's better content. Um, and a critical mass of systems, much like the personal computer really took off and some of the gaming platforms took off at a certain point of uh, there being enough of them out there to attract the developers. Very cool. We've got a couple questions. I know Steve had some questions, but I want to ask you this first. This has come up a couple times just about ethics. And, you know, are our ethics being considered? What are standards that have been developed to protect you know, our our data and like what exists, where, where do we need to go when it comes to ethics? Well, the, the good news is that there's um, a number of people who are uh, focused on this. Uh, there's a uh, organization, XRSI, that's particularly focused on how to um, design um, in a way that's culturally inclusive and interpret the data in a way that doesn't have biases in it and uh, promote the development of a rich variety of culturally diverse and age appropriate experiences. Um, in terms of data protection, I think we're getting much better at uh, locking down our data using uh, technology that evolved from cryptocurrency like blockchain to pro pro provide access to people who should have access and prevent access to people who shouldn't. Um, certainly much better than we used to have stacks of uh, analog handwritten records where the files could be lost or it was hard to keep track of, but also making it more accessible makes it also, you know, very important to keep things confidential. So it is an important issue. I think there's also the issue of um, if we start building more and more um, um, environments where 
people can meet each other as like, for example, if we're helping people who are spending a long time in the children's hospital and we're trying to connect them with other peers, how do we do that in a safe and moderated manner? So these are design issues. And the good news, I think, is that um, we're a little, we're, we're we're on it and people are working hard to address some of these issues. Let me can I follow up on that line of questioning because it's in my prior life Walter I was in the pathology imaging world and Please. that's taken great leaps leaps during the past you know two years because of everything with COVID and there was this this I think disconnect between empowering the patient you talk about patient agency and the power the insurers have to really govern your healthcare. <clears throat> How do we use VR to further empower the patient versus further empower the insurance company to simply just dictate for a disease state, this is what you get? Because I love that idea of precision medicine and patient agency. Well, from my viewpoint, um, uh, data is power, and if we can show the value of a particular um, system, and, and not just, um, we need to look at the whole business um, of medicine and the business ergonomics of it. It's one thing to come up with an innovative technology that that helps with healthcare, but it's not going to be accepted if it creates more time constraints for the clinicians, makes them stay longer, or if somebody else has to be in charge of charging the batteries or if it doesn't, if it makes things more expensive as opposed to reducing costs. So it's a matter of good design, but also study. We need to study the full impact of these technologies and show their value, be able to demonstrate the value. The good news is, you know, uh, we, these some of these technologies are having great impact. Uh, the validation studies are showing that impact. And, and in my mind, I know it's not easy, but in my mind, if we show that it has both healthcare value and economic value to the ecosystem, it, it will be adopted. Well, and especially if we can if we can enable a patient to be involved in those decision process processes with the power of that data, right? It, it's so often the pathologist would say kind of what the patient doesn't know, you know, won't hurt them, right? If it's a two day delay in a in a cancer diagnosis, it's not going to change the standard of care. And I'm like, but it's going to change their life for the next 48 hours. So That's there's true. there's that precision and immediacy that I think VR and telehealth can can enable if done correctly. Uh, I, I just worry about you know the payers getting more and more power and disintermediating the patients. Well, you know I, I I agree with the concern, but I also think thing you know there's a there's the continents are colliding right now and the earthquakes are are knocking things down. Um, the tech sector is jumping into healthcare and they're focused on the consumer. That's who they sell to. So as Apple, Google, Samsung, uh, Facebook and, uh, and Amazon and Walmart and others start getting more active in healthcare and targeting the consumer and giving the consumer more agency, I think things will change. And I think uh, I think giving information to the consumer too to support their decisions is, is um, inevitable. It's not just good business, but it's something that's going to happen no matter what. So, uh, I, I think it. I think it will get better, uh, Steve. But, you know, it's it's uh, there's also a lot of inertia in this um, arena too. But I think what you're doing with helping address uh, the awareness of brain health is just emblematic of what needs to happen. Is help people understand what they can do to make a difference in their healthcare and give them the tools to do it. Um, Walter, another question. How have developers and academicians responded to COVID and leveraged all of this for tackling some of these mental health issues that we have? Well, um, at the research level, initially there was a lot of problems. A lot of the studies we were doing, we had to change because we weren't having, um, you know, we weren't able to um, have people come into a, a center to be evaluated and use RVR systems, but then many of the research sites pivoted and started doing just what are called distributed clinical trials and um, leveraging technology to do that. Um, I think the um, I think COVID has also um, 
um, made breakthroughs in the barriers of regulation involving telemedicine. And that had been a significant barrier before. And it also, I think, helped people um, understand uh, the value of healthcare and how interconnected people are. And we also understood how for our aging seniors, how isolation can be not only uh, no fun, but also deadly. And uh, we, we're we now understanding how we can leverage technology to fill in the gaps. So I think COVID of course has been a horrible experience for you know all of us uh, and impacting us in, in so many ways, but in the field of digital health, I think it's helped uh, help move things forward in a, in a robust way. Well, thank you. There's there's some people that are really asking, it's like a, about where can they get intervention, you know, VR, AR intervention. So how would you help guide somebody who's like on the East Coast? What, where can people go to actually find practitioners that specialize and offer this, you know, beyond just being a consumer of the technology, but also being able to have some real directed intervention? Uh, I, the good news is there's several pathways and it all depends on what what problem you're addressing. If you're, uh, if you're looking for something in the health and wellness zone, there's some amazing products that uh, you can um, purchase um, or subscribe to that leverage wearable sensors and virtual environments to teach uh, uh, skills, some like for weight management, some for promoting exercise, some to promote uh, uh, cognitive health. Uh, so those are available for, um, for outside of the clinical ecosystem, but on the health and wellness arena. Um, there's also um, in the clinical zone, it depends on the, the, the problem, but there's centers that have said, we're going to move forward with this technology and, and embrace it and, and use it aggressively. Others are still watching and waiting. Um, I should have brought the um, I should have brought the link with me, but there's uh, Howard Gurr, spelled G-U-R-R, I believe, uh, has put together for uh, treating um, um, phobias and some aspects of mental health. He's, he's collected a database. I think it, you can find it by searching on online of clinicians who are in private practice who are using virtual environments to to treat um, fear of heights, fear of flying, uh, um, other forms of um, of problems. And then, you know, for example, if you had a problem with vertigo and there are some virtual reality systems that can help you address that, um, maybe look at the the people the manufacturers of these systems and see where they've placed systems or ask them who's using your system and in my neighborhood uh, i guess another way would be to look to see where there's some clinical trials going on on the efficacy of this so it really depends on what where things are um, for stroke rehabilitation uh, for example uh, there's a number of hospitals that have already brought the system into their acute rehab facilities um, I, I wish I had a list, but I think if you look around and ask around, uh, and it's just around the corner, and maybe by asking you can you can prompt the, your clinical group to to consider bringing it in too. Great. What what about so some people are starting to ask about some very specific types of disorders. So okay. what about a therapeutic benefit for people with dementia? Does VR have, is, is there evidence for this or? Well, there's, there, yes. And it's, it is in a variety of forms. Uh, there are a number of um, um, virtual reality uh, product development groups that are selling to the senior care market. And for dementia, it's more on the palliative side helping um, helping t instead of parking someone in front of a television set or having them sit there uh, without any interaction with other people. Um, we have seen systems used to help address uh, uh, and teach people some skills. Um, also for enabling research uh, into different therapeutic applications for dementia, uh, virtual environments have been useful to capture the data about uh, changes in cognitive processes. I mean, there's no, there's no, um, I would not say there's something that can um, be used to treat um, some of the neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's in a robust way, 
but there's ways that can help address some of the symptoms. And also, importantly, I think do a better differential diagnosis. If you go into some of the memory care centers um, and do an inventory of how many people there have Lewy body disease, how many of them have um, metabolic disorder, how many have uh, uh, Alzheimer's, the portions don't add up to what is the incidence. And it's often because it's hard to do a good differential diagnosis. And it's important because there's different clinical pathways depending on the diagnosis. So I think both in the short run of helping address symptoms, connecting families, there's a, a, a number of just released a product called the Real Connect, which is a very low cost VR headset that allows you to have a virtual reality experience, but any, anyone you choose to invite to join you, and they can do it through a cell phone or a desktop or a laptop, can be there with you, see what you're seeing, talk to you, you can look over and you can see them there with you. And that's a great way of addressing uh, um, being with loved ones who might be in a memory care center, be with them while they have an experience. And it might be a very relaxing experience being along the beach or it might be a very engaging experience like going shopping in Florence. But I think uh, for many ways addressing some of the challenges our seniors involve just connectivity, which technology can allow us to do and get over some of the barriers we've had with COVID. Yeah, I think it's interesting because so many of us probably, you know, two years ago, that may have seemed um, foreign and strange, but I definitely think COVID has, has um, desensitized us or sensitized us to the importance of FaceTime, Zoom, Teams, even when it, it gets wonky, we still have this ability to connect. So I think it's so interesting to think about how um, just circumstances I'm imagining have kind of opened up the aperture for this too and the desire for it. And, and I think one thing that's related to the question about uh, addressing dementias is that I think many of the uh, medications that we've been trying to develop to help address uh, neurodegenerative disease have been hampered by a, less, a lack of effective measurement systems of cognitive processes. And I think VR is going to allow us to do a better job of evaluating the efficacy of some of these um, new medications. I think that'll attract more investment money into this and maybe take some of the medications that you know, were, were put on the shelf because the results were ambiguous, maybe with better measurements. Uh, there's one company that um, I, I think has done some collaboration with the uh, uh, Center for Brain Health, uh, Altoida, that uses an augmented reality system to do a memory test, but they also capture um, um, the what they call neuromotor index, which is how smooth is the trajectory of your movements while you're doing this task with the tablet. And they, the data they've collected, the studies have done have indicated they can identify who's going to convert from mild cognitive impairment over to uh, neurogenetic disease, sometimes five years earlier than other tests. So that's a powerful thing that I think will help us come up with better therapies uh, for, for that very important clinical problem. Nice. Um, Somebody is asking about, well, a couple of people are kind of like, how do I get involved? So there's been some questions about how do they get, how do people get involved in your research? Also, some people are asking, you know, here from Anne, a talk and art therapist, really active in this kind of world. How does somebody get involved in the development? So it's kind of like, how can people get involved in VR development? and being in that front end, but also how can people get involved directly with your research, Walter? Okay, well, um, the good news is uh, there's there's a number of pathways to to, um, to do both. Um, the um, IVRA, IVRHA, the International Virtual Reality Health Association.org, IVRHA.org, puts on uh, regular meetings, um, um, well, we did before COVID, now they're being done virtually, but we're starting to, I think the next one will be in person in Dublin, and then there's one in Nashville in the spring. Also, Cedar sinai puts together a meeting, and it's a great spot where artists, where programmers, where scientists, uh, clinicians, and you know, um, hospital administrators come to learn and figure out how they can apply technology. Um, we're, we're publishing a book on November 6th, I think it is, uh, on VR for healthcare. Um, 
and uh, that has a you know a, a compendium of, of summaries of some of the research that's going on. Um, there's um, a number of groups that um, would love to have um, uh, people join them either as um, consultants or employees. A uh, number of early stage um, companies that are developing next generation applications. Um, um, and uh, in terms of the research that we're doing at, at Stanford, uh, I, I think right now, um, it, you know, there's at the Virtual Human Interaction Lab, we, um, um, I think we're not taking on new graduate students, but we do need people to help with some of our studies once we start bringing people back in for research. But over at uh, the Department of Psychiatry, Kim Bullock has put together a number of uh, uh, of people who get together who are come from all different clinical sectors and we have a monthly zoom meeting I'll, I'll share the link for that too where people from all over the world who are interested in um, virtual environments for um, mental health care log in and talk about their work um, and um, at the children's hospital there's a network uh, of i think 10 of the leading children's hospitals are teaming the resources to see how they can apply vr technology to each other and there's a publication, um, uh, uh, the program is called Innovate, I-N-N-O-V-A-T-E. I'll, I'll follow up with some of the links for this and maybe we can send it out to the, to, to, um, to people who are asking these questions. Great. Can you talk, I mean, we're, we're starting to run on time, but can you talk about VR in depression and anxiety treatment? Uh, sure. Um, for well, for the approach we have for anxiety disorders is is in some ways very similar, but also in many ways different from how we address uh, depression. Um, basically, we leverage the the already established protocols for cognitive behavioral therapy um, and behavioral activation and acceptance and commitment therapy. Some of the uh, things that are currently done, but by um, leveraging the power of virtual environments to help um, promote adherence and engagement and create um, you know a more powerful experience for the individuals who are who are doing this um, we so for example um, for an anxiety disorder we do exposure therapy where if you're afraid of heights or afraid of spiders uh, or have a social anxiety disorder uh, we simulate that much like what um, Aaron was describing with the charisma program we can evoke and have people practice the skills they need. Um, for depression, uh, it's, uh, we start with behavioral activation, where we have people who might um, not be getting pleasure out of doing things. And so their homework assignment is to do some activities that used to give them pleasure and practice doing them. And maybe we make it easier the first few times in the virtual environment or make it more fun, gamify it a bit. Um, I should also say one of the areas that's really surging forward is in the field of treating depression and anxiety and post-traumatic stress using combination therapy with psychedelics. Um, there's a number of groups that are using um, um, ketamine and um, psilocybin as part of the therapeutic uh, for combination. I think Texas actually recently passed uh, some, um, some legislation requiring research in this area to help with combat post-traumatic stress. And uh, the um, it's not that people would wear a virtual headset while they're uh, having a, a, that type of therapy, but to prepare them for it, to reduce the anticipatory anxiety for the experience, and also to help with the set and setting of the experience and the post-session integration. Virtual environments are very powerful tools for helping address anxiety and depression through that therapeutic pathway. And also to connect people who are doing some of these therapies at home uh, so that they can be managed and monitored and helped uh, in a telemedicine manner. So the technology is, I think, it's not a one size fits all where, you know, the same paradigm is used for all these indications. And we're still learning as, as we go what works the most effectively, but the, the basic premise is, is that we can create an experience for people and that experience can be highly engaging and highly motivating and show them the consequences of their choices and motivate them to stick with the program in a much better way than a stack of papers or a videotape might might do for people. And uh, there's more around the corner. You know, it it's so relevant. I was just looking at one of the other questions, Walter, and 
someone was asking, you know, it, are, is there a resistance to this by people with autism and do they are they comfortable with it? And I was really surprised when I saw our own Charisma team report. The data we see back is in some ways it's a more comfortable environment for people with some of these disorders to actually play off of in the avatar setting rather than in a in a what might seem like a confrontational setting with a therapist so it's a it's a really fascinating world where it's in some ways a softer touch i i was not a believer in this years ago uh but seeing what happens with the charisma team especially with these patient uh these clients with social challenges it it can be life-changing uh because they they actually try things they wouldn't try in real life well, there's a lot of power, I think, of um, being able to adjust the complexity of the world around you and focus on what skills you need to learn. And also, you know, we can we can do a variety of things that otherwise you'd need to use your imagination to do some role playing, for example, or and it, it's just very difficult to do without the aid of um, a virtual environment. But once we have it, uh, you can really get someone there and get them to stick with it and and provide insight by an experience and so much more powerful than other ways. And I should also mention that we're, we've looked at using VR for senior care. Uh, initially, people were worried that seniors wouldn't like wearing something or using something. And they actually think it's a lot easier to use than a cell phone and um, and love the fact that they can go someplace, maybe someplace that was on their bucket list with a family member that they otherwise couldn't couldn't do. What a great what a great point to end it on, right, Jen? I mean, that's just the possibilities are are really limitless. Uh, it's it's fascinating to me how we can leverage technology to create a more realistic experience. I mean, it seems a little bit counterintuitive, but that's exactly where we're getting. Well, maybe next time we can have this and all meet in a shared virtual environment. That would be awesome. That would be that. awesome. We should do that. Well, listen, thank you, Walter. I mean, really, I just, I, I remember two years ago, we were sitting in San Francisco just talking about these things uh, pre-pandemic, and it's hard to believe in a blink of an eye that two years has gone by. Jen, thank you as, as usual. And again, thanks to everyone who attended. Uh, it's really, really important for us to get the word out about these things. Thank you for participating. And again, the Brain Health Project is meant to be, you know, Walter talked about it, right? We're trying to bring awareness to people. We're trying to bring healthcare to people using technology. And that's exactly what the Brain Health Project is. It's a way for you to get access to contribute to research, but guess what? You're going to get training that's going to help you with anxiety and depression and be a clearer thinker and be more innovative. You don't have to go sit in a cave for two years and wonder, wonder how am I doing in this research project? It's actually interactive. So if you're interested, please sign up. Um, we'd love to have you in the project. Walter, I'm sure we'll be in touch soon. And Aaron, I think we ought to we ought to put it on our account that Nashville event on our calendar. Uh, I think maybe we ought to make sure we can circle up with Walter in Nashville in April. I think that would be really cool. Well, and, and I think maybe one of the answers to the question of how can people get involved is to to get in touch with your program. Yeah, it it it's a great start. And uh, Walter, thanks so much for being a collaborator. Uh, it's hard to be so brilliant and so humble at the same time. Walter's a great example of that. Uh, thanks so much. Really appreciate everybody's involvement tonight. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I hope you have a great night. Good night, everybody. Wonderful experience. Thank you.